You think evolution is true, but you think that there are problems with natural selection. That's what you said? Yeah, I think there's an issue with selection for and that it can't actually make any predictions. Oh, that's weird. You know, there's like a journal of evolutionary biology. I mean, like scientists. Yeah, mine is do... an op. Oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. mine's an a priori objection, so the empirical data isn't really going to matter. Uh, I, my I'm... my argument is that in principle, natural selection can't disambiguate co-founding or co-extensive traits. So, okay, so is this the F Jeremy? What was his first name? I don't remember Jeremy Fodor's argument or whatever against natural selection. Um, yeah, it's similar to that, yeah. Okay. Um, well, do you, like, can you just make the case in a succinct way without, like, uh, rambling for a super long time? Because I'm not really sure, sure. what I mean, exactly um, to respond to. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you know, like, any bit of Fodor's argument, or do you just want me to kind of start fresh? Yeah, I did, like, I did a two-hour debate on this once okay uh well what i guess what matters is understanding like what are called intentional and extensional contexts yeah. um, so uh so if you think about an in intentional or if we talk about some type of like extensional context um we can say some some like causal mechanism is like a extensional context so if we say something like the dodgy wire in the attic caused you know the fire um, in an extensional context we can swap out co-referential terms like fire and smoke uh, in this case you know where there's fire there's smoke um, and we'll preserve truth value of the proposition so we can say the dodgy it's true that the dodgy wire caused the fire and replace fire with smoke and it's true that the fire caused the smoke right um, and so we can change out these um, co-referential terms and preserve the truth value. But what um, natural selection purports to be is an intentional context that it can actually select for some phenotypic trait um, as opposed to maybe like a free rider or like a ride along, right? Which makes it an intentional context. Something sure. like if Lois Lane... You know, so extensional context like uh, Clark Kent can fly, Superman can fly. We can replace Clark, Clark Kent, Superman, and we preserve truth value. But if we did something like Lois Lane believes Superman can fly, um, if we change that out with Clark Kent, that proposition risks not becoming true anymore because she doesn't know that Clark Kent is Superman. And so we risk um, not preserving the truth value once we swap out those co-referential terms. And so the analogy here is just that natural selection is something that selects for some phenotypic trait um, such that it can disambiguate between the free rider. So if we say that a, like some population with hearts survives and some um, other population without hearts doesn't survive, we could appeal to like the pumping of the heart or like the thump thump sounds that the heart produces. Right. Yep. But clearly, like, we look at the world and we don't think that, like, the thump thump sounds have any effect. Like, we clearly know that the pumping of the blood is responsible for um, survival. And so if natural selection can do what it purports to do, it should be able to disambiguate those two co-founding variables. But given that it's this, like, causal mechanism, um, we're not going to be able to swap out the... Um, the co-referential traits and be able to determine which one we're selected for. We're only going to be able to show which traits we're selected of. And so if natural selection is this um, process at which, or mechanism at which can determine what is selected for, then it can't do what it purports to do. Right. So <clears throat> again, I have already had this discussion, but I think there's a, one of the issues is you can't tell if natural selection is selecting uh, just traits or like, cause it can't distinguish between the free riders or whatever. But 
Um, that's really not the case because traits can be linked. So let's say that, uh, do you know who Dmitry Belyav was? I do not. So he was this uh, very famous Russian Evolu- I don't know if he was a geneticist or an evolutionary biologist or whatever, but he did this. Is he the guy that uh, like coined pleiot- pleiotrophy? Pleiotropy? I don't think so. But he did this oh, okay. domestic. I'm someone else. Sorry. He did this domesticated fox experiment, and uh, for all I know, this experiment is still going on. So, <clears throat> what they did was they they selectively bred uh, foxes. I, th- I think I might have said wolves, but they were foxes. Selectively bred them to be. Uh, more docile, and there was just some. There was one trick: would they let them uh, be fed by hand without like biting the hand that fed them? And that was it. Um, and obviously, generation after generation, the foxes became more and more like receptive toward humans. But as that mm-hmm. happened, they also got floppy ears. Their tails became curly. Their coats became n- not exactly spotted, but like the the dark and the light patterns in their coat separated like what domesticated animals have think of like a dalmatian or a beagle or a dairy cow you know Mm -hmm. um all of these all these traits that had nothing to do with what they were selecting for because it turned out that those traits are like in close proximity on chromosomes to the traits that they actually are selecting for so um it it actually is the case like even a even a trait that seems irrelevant like we're trying to pick something let me just actually read you the trait i came up with um let's say that people who are immune to some disease also have no fingerprints not having fingerprints isn't helping them survive and so natural selection can't tell us why that trait is being selected for uh, but free riders are selected for because they are linked to other genes. So if the free rider is baggage to the gene being selected for, um, then the gene being selected for is also baggage for that free rider. So that means even an irrelevant characteristic still provides an evolutionary advantage. So yes, in this case, having no fingerprints does predict how likely you are to be immune to whatever that disease is. Um, so I'm not seeing though, how that's the case. like, if you're just, con- it seems like you're conceding the argument at that point. Like if you're saying that, um, you could, no, have I'm, I'm saying that the problem isn't a problem, but it would be a problem. Like if, so if we're supposed to be able to say what phenotypic trait leads to fixation in a population, which Fodor, myself, you all agree is a fact of the matter, right? We all agree that there's some phenotypic trait that like um, leads to fixation, reproductive sex- success in a population, um, right? We don't want some type of like godlike introduction into our theory, right? Because that's not scientific, right? So we want to avoid those types of explanations. Um, but also looking at what's purported by the theory, and the theory is purported to be able to say which phenotypic traits are selected upon, right? Natural selection is talking about what phenotypic traits are selected for. I don't see how talking about the genotype or anything like that's going to help you. Especially, like, well, because like, you can talk about things like selective sweep and stuff like that, but the problem would still remain regardless of like selective sweep. or. Well, I, I think it does for a couple other reasons that I haven't unpacked. One, natural selection doesn't select for traits. Uh, the The level of selection is the gene. That was the revolution that Richard Dawkins came up with in the 70s when he wrote The Selfish Gene. The, the only thing that actually gets selected for are, are, are the genes themselves. So we're not, we're not selecting for, um, oh, I don't know like the ability to be immune for blank. It's just a gene that corresponds with that. And there are very few genes for one specific thing. Um, I'm not exactly sure where I was going with that, but it's it's just, it's it's really complicated, I guess. Um, so I agree the, that it is. Lo- I guess I'm just confused that like, it doesn't seem like, it's, 
seems like I don't know. I, I might not just understanding your response, and so there might be just you know failure on my part. So I leave that open. But uh, I guess what I'm not understanding is how it isn't a concession if what seems to be stated is that uh, it's true natural selection in the case of a free rider can't actually determine what is selected for because I mean like think about it this way like think about if I just had this box of crickets and I throw crickets into the box that has like a filter at the bottom right and it weeds out the crickets and me and you go back we look at the box and what comes out of the so we throw black crickets or a whole bunch of crickets in there and we notice that the, the crickets that survive are black and have wings right um and we could like assess, um, given when we throw all the crickets into the box and we get uh, winged crickets, but what remains are wingless crickets. Like it's easy for me and you to look at that without employing any theory at all that what the uh, reproductive advantage was was something like flight to get away from predators in the box or whatever. And that's why they survived and could get out of get get out of the funnel outside of the other side of the box and they survive. But like, if it just turns out that I can also appeal to the blackness, because where I get blackness, I get the wingness. Then what we're saying is that that mechanism, the box, isn't selecting for like the wingness. It's selecting of these traits, and so it's just not clear that natural selection is something that actually tells us what phenotypic trait actually me and you and my grandmother can just go out and look at some ecology and go yeah it's clear that like the things with longer necks are going to survive because they can reach the trees you don't need um any theory like so like in other words biologists are making predictions they're they're making successful predictions but they're not invoking the theory of natural selection right because especially if we just concede that we can't actually disambiguate between the phenotypic traits because then in virtue of what <laughs> it's clearly some like ancestral understanding or historical understanding of ecology, right? Something that we just observe with our eyes. I don't think you need a theory of natural selection to tell me that things with hearts will survive and the things without hearts won't. Right. Um, well, why else would they survive? Or like, what else would explain that organisms that lack specific traits well, don't survive as well as other ones? Because it's like telling me that it's like telling me that um, you want to play the stock market and that you, I, you want to know like you're like J Mike, you, you know, you play a really good um, game in the stock market, uh, but how is it that like? you actually come to some conclusion of like what principle that I should like, you know, buy into, right? Should I buy into like, like I want to play the game of the stock market. How, like, what should I do? And I just tell you buy low, sell high, right? That clearly will explain every dollar that you make or that you sell, right? Or every, I'm sorry, every dollar that you make or every dollar that you lose, right? But yeah. it's not going to tell you what, what's like, uh, stocks you should buy, how the corporate ladder works, and what predictions you should make. And if it turns out that it's just trivially true that uh, organisms with some phenotypic trait that mean you can observe, you know, uh, survive in some population, I didn't have to invoke any theory. Uh, yeah, but again, it's not about the phenotypic trait; it's about the genes. So, wait, so then you disagree with by, with that, and also natural selection selects that, against that there's a selection not for pressure on phenotypic traits. Um, there is, but there is, but the traits evolution. aren't being selected for. It's the genes. Um, but also, so the there's standard understanding in, in real quick, biology and real quick like the classes I've taken in college was that the selection. Are you on hearing me? Traits. Yeah, you said it's selected on the genotype. Yeah, and then I and then I said, hold on, because I I had more things to say. But also, um, natural selection, like you keep saying things that, like, I I think that they make your argument work, but I think they're just fundamentally flawed. Which is that traits don't get selected for genes do, and natural selection selects against, not for 
things. Against is still an intentional context. Like Alex Rosenberg gave this response, and that doesn't help you. Selection against is still intentional with an S, not intentional with a T. It's still um, something that if you change the coextensive traits, you don't preserve truth value. So changing selection for and selection against doesn't actually absolve the problem. It concedes the problem. Like someone like Alex Rosenberg, who who wants to suggest selection against, is just conceding the problem. Uh, I, I don't see how that's the case. When you... Because selection against is intentional. If I look, think about it, if I select like selection uh, and when we talk about an intentional context, like I said, we risk preserving the truth value. And so if it's some in, like you're selecting against this trait, this free rider or something, as opposed to this other trait that leads to success, that's the same problem because it's not like um, I swap out the two um, traits and I preserve truth value, right? Like think like a polar bear, for example, being selected for its whiteness as opposed to being selected for its camouflaging into its environment, those don't mean the same thing. If I swap those two out, I, I, I risk preserving truth value because being selected for its whiteness might not mean camouflaging into its environment. Yeah, but you could test whether or not that is the case. Like these hypotheticals that you propose exist in a vacuum um, and they don't. science, is, are, science is not armchair writers. philosophy. We actually do uh, test these things out. But this isn't about empirical tests. This is an a priori objection. This is no different than if, like, we took um, I mean, some ob uh, objection that you can't have true contradictions, and we say that, like, you know, the Schrodinger's it, yeah, uh, that, interpretation of quantum mechanics it invokes some, like, contradiction, right? Yeah, and if that, that's the case, that's then great. It's not but this is just a to the theory. That's great, but this is just a, a convoluted grammatical trick. Uh, that only works in the imaginary land of ideas where nothing ever happens. That's, that's not, not science, an that's and that's why I find these conversations to be utterly useless. So you don't think that a priori, you don't think that you can show that some scientific or empirical theory, in principle, can't do what it purports to do because that doesn't involve an empirical analysis. That involves just looking at the the desiderata, uh, desiderata that you that you invoke, and then whether or not those things can actually do what they purport to do. If it turns out that in principle they can't, you don't need to do any empirical research to show that some empirical theory can't do what it purports to do in principle. I just need to show you what you're, what you're okay, committed that to. Made, that made, by reductio show you, you can't do that. Yeah, so that made absolutely no sense. So can you explain that in a better way? If you saw something traveling faster, if, uh, faster than light in space, do you not think that that would, do you not think that that in principle would defeat a lot. <laughs> like, I thought, I thought right? you told like, me that we don't... something that would falsify specific theories we have, right? I thought you said this had nothing to do with empiric empiricism or empirical data. Yeah, but I'm trying to get on your level and show you something in the world we could observe so that I can get back to the point. Well, don't appeal to an empirical observation to tell me that empirical okay, observations that's, well, Okay, don't. that's fine. Then I'll just... Go, yeah, that's fine. So, like, in principle, if we could show, like... Um, I don't know that there are true contradictions or that some logical, uh, you know, axioms or something hold that that might affect whether or not like some quant like some interpretation on quantum mechanics, right? It might not be as much of a problem for some interpretation, uh, like a Copenhagen interpretation of, of quantum mechanics, like someone might might want to point out, right? Right, like, was, was there a thought uh, in there? Because I didn't catch, I, I didn't catch it. Okay, so like this is really simple. If no, it's you have not. some empirical theory, in principle, I don't have to do any any work at all in the world to show you that your theory can't get off the ground if it can't do what it purports to do in principle. How do right? you know you that? How do you know whether or not it can do what it purports to do in by principle? By giving you the argument that an argument four doesn't prove is anything. an intentional context. And causal yep, mechanisms yep. mechanisms are an extensional context. Yep. That's a grammatical trick. It's not a I, the grammatical real, the real trick. world is yes, it is. These are these are made up words that mean they mean nothing. How is this an objection? Really? But, well, I'm trying to tell you. So these these words, all words, their meaning is declared by fiat. Um, at some point, somebody just says this is what 
this means. It it says nothing about whether or not it actually is true in the universe or whatever. So like you can argue that all of these things going on in our model, well, there we we have all of these problems because of intentionality, so on and so forth. So uh it's so basically it sounds like you're saying natural selection contains logical contradictions and we no, don't even have to test I didn't whether... say that at all i said that natural selection is purported to be an intentional context and causal mechanisms are an extensional context we risk preserving the truth value when we point out these uh, phenotypic traits what i'm pointing out is that natural selection cannot disambiguate between what phenotypic trait was selected for because I can, against, I can tell and the it doesn't same select exact story traits. with the thumping of the heart. Like, think of it this way. Yep. We go look at a population of organisms with hearts and without hearts, right? And the ones without hearts don't survive. That didn't, by the way, that didn't take any theory for us to, like, predict that, right? We can just, like, know how anatomy works and understand that things without hearts are probably not going to survive. Or things that have hearts that degenerate over time will probably not survive. We look at we go back the population with heart survive, but there's phenotypic traits we can appeal to, like the thumping of the heart. We can appeal to the the pumping of the heart, and me and you clearly know it's the pumping of the heart, the mechanism of the heart that aids in the reproductive success. But I can tell you the same story by appealing to a phenotypic trait, like the thumping of the heart. Now, if we don't want the same story, which we don't, we don't want to be able to say that what was selected for was the thumping of the heart, which gives us the same re reproductive success as appealing to the, th to the pumping of the blood. It gives us the same, but I appeal to a different phenotypic trait to ride along and tell the same story. Now, if nat natural selection wants to tell us something that's not trivial, it needs to be able to disambiguate and tell us which phenotypic trait was selected for. That's the problem. The problem is natural selection doesn't select traits. It, select, it selects genes. So there's an enormous misunderstanding none of, none of right that, off the it, bat. But none of selecting genes, like this is like a common response I get. I don't see how selecting for the genotype solves the problem. Like what do you, what do you when you think that it selects for the genotype rather than the phenotype, what problem do you think is absolved? Not the genotype, genes. Okay, when, when it's selected for whatever set of genes, how is that absolving the problem that what comes along with those genes is another phenotypic trait that's a ride-along? Because it doesn't select for traits. It selects for genes. Yeah, so... I you ju you just said, oh, the genes, the the genes don't help <laughs> because what if, it, what, if, what, if, what if you point to the genotype but you still get this other phenotype? Like, you... You keep bringing up non sequiturs, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. No, I'm not bringing up a non sequitur. Then I'm stop talking out. about traits. Like, come so up with an can't... argument on the level of the gene, which is what is actually okay. selected for. All right. Well, one, I can, like, I don't like being the pulling up, like, sources police because I just don't like that tactic. But, like, I've talked to so many biologists and not a single one of them disagree that it's their selection for on the phenotype but even if you did selecting on the genotype doesn't like absolve the problem right look i'm an atheist why not i i don't believe god exists i think in fact god does not exist i'm not like some creationist right i think evolution is true i think that why, uh, that why do you think why do you think selecting at the level of genes is still a problem because it doesn't because this the phenotypic trait that rides along in the in whatever it doesn't case that select you give, for phenotypic traits okay so you think that okay you think that backing up the problem and talking about selecting for the genes all of a sudden paints a different picture that there's no longer the ride along trait so again the ride along it's not like, it's not like it erases it uh Right? This is like why selective I, sweep or or like pleiotrophy or any of these things aren't like a solution to the problem, right? Like I would love a solution to the problem. I've been looking for a solution to the problem for years. <laughs> like this is an issue. This is an a, priori, an a priori objection to the theory. And obviously evolution isn't dependent on natural selection. Me and you would both agree to that. There's like several mechanisms, right? I mean, right. this doesn't like even change the landscape of biology. What's, but what the force of the argument is, is that biologists are smarter than the theory that they're invoking. 
They're way smarter than the theory. They're, they're making predictions, but they're not invoking natural selection to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just disagree. So again, no, the, the free right. If, if we if we analyze this on the level of the uh, of the gene, then those free rider traits again. That's just a hypothetical in the real world. Like my example about the disease. Uh, like if you're immune to disease, you don't have fingerprints. That's not real. I made that up. Okay. I can give you it, real examples: camouflaging into one's environment and being white. That's a real. Those are two phenotypic traits. You can't swap yeah, so them you can out test and whether or not the, the value of the proposition. Yeah, you'd have to experimentally verify that. Yeah, but what kind of what kind of mechanism is this that when I change it out in different boxes, or I change it out in different e e uh, ecosystems, that it doesn't even hold it, doesn't give me any novel predictive success? That when it, what I'm supposed to be able to do is when it's selected for is camouflaging into the environment that I can swap it out with its whiteness and then I go to some other eco like I can put on a white shirt go all out white right now and it's not going to camouflage me into my environment just by having that phenotypic trait right it's clearly not going to preserve the truth value once I swap those those two phenotypic traits out with each other but a causal mechanism like um, this the like the dodgy wire in the attic causing the fire when I replace that with smoke that works because a causal mechanism that's responsible for the fire, responsible for the smoke, I can, I can transfer those things out with no problem. And given that natural selection is supposed to be some causal mechanism, right, that's supposed to hold. But it doesn't hold. It turns out that when I swap out the, the ride-along trait, I don't preserve truth value of the proposition. What ride-along trait? You, you told me whiteness blending into the environment and whiteness, and then you said something about wearing Fro a shirt. Frogs I snapping at flies versus snapping at amb ambient dots, um, right? Which we have empirical evidence for. <laughs> I mean, there's several examples that Fodor even gives in his book. But it's just not, it, like you say, you don't see it's a problem, but like it's not even clear to me that you even know what Fodor's argument is. So like, could I ask you to steel man what the argument's supposed to be? Because the problem that I run into when I talk with people about this is that they reject Fodor's argument without even understanding what it is. Um, I, I, I listened to a debate that he did about this, and Danny sent me some stuff about him. Uh, basically, the, the crux of the problem seems to be we can't distinguish whether or not evolution it, or uh, whether or not natural selection is specifically selecting for um, these certain traits or characteristics or whatever, or if it's, I'm probably not going to be able to give a good, uh, uh, description of the argument. If I'm being honest, the whole intention, -y, well, no, intentionality that, and extensionality thing you can have an just doesn't make any sense to me, but. Okay. But look, so I appreciate the honesty. But I don't understand how you think the argument doesn't work if you don't understand the argument. Well, because you keep saying things that are critically flawed, like that it selects traits. It doesn't. It selects genes, right? I'm literally um, looking at something on my left on my Oculus right now, and it says, like on the Wikipedia, it says selects four phenotypic traits. Okay. Pop science is often inaccurate and belies the, the truth of things. I have, I, look. Like, I, like uh, Look, people that study Peterson, physics and I, I especially like quantum mechanics will, buying, will tell you this. I have a hobby of going to thrift stores and buying biology books. I have eight, eight of them on my desk. I will pull up every one of them and every single one of them will say selects for phenotypic traits. Every single one of them. Okay. And and that's why I said even if I just every, ignore every, that, every single high school science textbook it doesn't change the uses problem. The, this is what you see on Bohr every photo and or video. Someone's like, "Oh, genes." And then every comment beyond that's, "How does that solve the problem?" And the person who who initially suggested it never comments back because they don't even know what they're saying. They yeah, just again, think it's a way out. Yeah. Uh, every single science textbook will show you the planetary Bohr model, which is wrong. So like there are lots of things that like in pop science, I, like I'm a science teacher. There are all kinds of things I say to my students and I'm like, oh, that's not really how it works. But they're they're 16 years old and this is the only useful way no, to I, communicate I agree with it that. with I think them. that, yeah, I think you have to, uh, honestly, I think you have to kind of 
do certain things in educational settings to like phase people into right like you, like that that I, that I can understand 100%. But I don't know that that's the problem here because I don't think it's like lying about it being selected for phenotypic traits, right? But I agree with you. I think that there are like I don't like how certain normative language is used in like examples of factories with cells because it gives creationists this like weird you know talking points to run with that like oh it's like a cell in a factory and who you know there has to be a person that runs the factory and right like i get it i think it's a poor way but you have to phase people into understanding the literature mm -hmm. but i don't know that that's what's going on here like, I honestly think that if all biologists accepted Fodor's issue, nothing, virtually nothing would change about biology. They would just realize that other mechanisms are responsible and that what natural selection performs, is purporting to do is just something kind of trivial. Like We can look out at the population. It's not hard to, to assess things that camouflage into their environment are going to have a better time. My grandmother could tell you that. Uh, has anything been proposed? Because we do experiments all the time. Yeah, but the experiments and the predictions we make are not invoking natural selection, right? When biologists make I, biologists are no, making I, I novel predictions, for, yeah, I, but and they're I not invoking an natural selection to do that. Yeah, and I asked for an alternative. Like there, there's never even been one proposed that I'm aware because of. Because I don't think I don't think there's a, a big hole in biology. I don't think that like acknowledging this puts a big hole in biology. It just it what it like literally nothing. We are on a great track. <laughs> We're on a good track in biology, in my opinion. This would virtually change nothing. All it would do is get biologists to realize a priori objections to, to theories are valuable, right? And we, sh and we should a... recognize that when we've been making these predictions, we haven't been invoking this theory because this theory has not been telling us what phenotypic trait is selected for, nor could we ever look in some future ecology and, and even give a novel prediction on what phenotypic trait is likely to be produced. So something right. I, I like that that's necessarily a problem, but we can't do any of that. So something I like to ask uh, religious Phil bros or whatever, when we're having these arguments, like they say, well, you can't even justify empir and you're not making this argument, but like when they say like, Oh, you can't even justify empiricism and uh, you can't ground logic and logic well, and I'm so an on and so forth. But... Um, what I like to ask them is, okay, let's just assume I adopt your worldview. What can you do that I cannot do? And none of them have ever come up with a response to that, which to me makes it sound like uh, you're just trying to win an argument and do nothing else. Now, that whole thing you just said about what should we, like, what would be the proposed alternative? Like, oh, well, we don't even need one. We just, I just want scientists to realize that they're not actually doing what they say they're doing. So... In, why, in what, why, why in what world would this make? In what world would this make us be able? To, so this is not about being able to do new or no, better why science. Why do I have to have an alternative? That's not my claim. If my you're claim saying that, that it's false, then my, my, yeah. But the fact that I can point out that some theory in principle can't do what it purports to do doesn't infer that I have a solution. Right, that doesn't make any sense. Like yeah, I could just be one person who goes around and then just what's the point of criticizing like, bringing it theories up? And I happen to be right on them, but that doesn't mean that I have to have a solution. Then what's right? the point why, of why? bringing it if up? If I'm right about there being a, a problem with it, then why does it mean I need a solution? We're just stuck at okay, w this just doesn't have a solution, right? At the moment, we should do some work so that we can do what? So that we can so well one we have an option to be able to disambiguate the two phenotypic, the ride along, right? Or be able to say what trait. Okay. So the for. point is and to that, be able to that do that happens, better that's science. Great. Someone maybe in what's called for somebody to do in this situation is to give an a priori counter objection to show that um, something goes wrong with the argument, right? Or that there's something wrong with the intentional extensional distinction, right? That's what they're called to do because it's an a priori objection. It's an objection in principle to the theory. I don't need to go out in the world to be able to uh, formulate this objection. The same way with any empirical theory. I don't have to go out in the world to formulate. I can just look at the language used and go, oh, there's an issue here. So the purpose is to be able to do better science. Well, I, I mean... Hope, I mean, I, that's always my goal. I mean, I think that empirical science is vastly better for 
you know, okay. knowledge than just sitting in an armchair. But right. this so is precisely not where I think that the armchair a priori considerations help. They help you in your theorizing. Yep. I'm not aware of any paradigm shifts in science that ever happened from somebody just having a better argument. It was always like new empirically verified or verifiable like real world observations. No, and it's not true at all. We've had we've had a priori objections to empirical theories all the time. There's like this isn't what paradigm like, if something in, if something in principle can't do what it purports to do, we discard it, right? And that's what that's just if you're saying that never happens, then I just don't know what world you live in. Right? So I, what I said was I'm not aware of any paradigm shifts in science that occurred because that occurred without without evidence. Sorry, it's not about a paradigm shift. It's just that the, then what's the this point? Is what's it, Wait, look, what I'm saying is constitutive of scientific inquiry. We do this in science. Perchance, could you tell me what that even means? Theoretical physicists do this. This is what they do. What do they do? They give do? a priori objections. They show in principle how something could, could work. They don't have to go out in the world to know that some phenomena that's being purported couldn't be true. Um, right? or, or given data they already know. They don't have I, to go in the world for future data to know that that thing can't be true, right? Really? Because this yes. this sounds like this sounds exactly like a creationist saying uh, evolution can't explain why bees fly because um, what was that argument? Um, like it's it's physically impossible for a bee to fly. I can't remember why they this, said this that was. Nothing to do with what I'm saying. And then they and then we realized oh. When we actually did some further studies, some scientific studies, we discovered that bees flap their wings in a different way. No scientific study is going to, to get you to the point where you say, oh, causal mechanisms turn out to be an intentional context. That is a philosophical issue that you have to absolve. Well, I don't care. Okay, well then, then if you don't care about an a priori oh, no. objection, that shows no, I don't care about theory, philosophical then... arguments about well, it's like, so, well, okay, the, the, jump, the case use of these percent. words leads to an absurdity or a contradiction. It's not whatever. about I, the I don't care about, about the imaginary land of ideas where nothing ever happens. I care okay, about so you don't, results. Do you, like, do you, you realize that words make up propositions that are true or false, right? Like we agree on that. Can, can people hear me? That's no, how we. It, yes, that's how we use the language. Yeah. But I, yeah, I one, so. one plus one equals two is only true in the sense that uh, th that's the rules of this thing called math that we invented. So I just, if I could, if I could just, I, I wanted to jump in to say a few things, but the main one relevant to the point being discussed now is that uh, as somebody who is both a self-ascribed philosophy asshole and a working scientist, uh, I think the distinction that you're presenting, uh, Peterson, is one that doesn't actually exist in terms of this division between experimental science and theoretical science. In the real world, what makes places like CERN and Fermilab and all of these advanced research facilities so exciting is that you have theoretical physicists and experimental physicists working together. The theoretical physicists are driving the ideas through largely a priori deductions and things like that. Thank That's you. what it means when we say the math makes this happen. Those things are the basis on which we make a hypothesis and design an experiment. And then the experimental physicists design hardware and conduct the experiments to determine whether or not those a priori judgments based on the mathematics actually firm out. Or if there was something about the deductions that were made or the math that was run that doesn't seem to line up with uh, reality. It's not that one of these things is inherently better than the other. They are two halves of the practice of science. And you need both I, of them to I arrive know. at anywhere. Yeah, and, and I know, way, can I, can I know I, that I at least the math that said that a, that a nuclear reaction that can't that. occur um, until the experiments verified that it can occur, right? Um, right? But what I've been hearing... Carl, are you J-Mike? Can I specify that every time that... Like, for whatever reason, you keep saying that I'm religious and that I'm... Uh, I don't know if you're saying that directly, but I'm not religious. Liter literally, never once said anything. Even oh, okay. Close well, to sorry. That. Maybe, maybe so anyways, I heard that wrong. That's, um, that's why I wanted to specify. Uh, what I kept hearing you don't say call me Dean. is something to the effect of, um, "Well, if it's if it's 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 wrong from the get go, so like it's over." And it's like, yeah, that's 
that that sounds like the whole well let's not even try to make a nuclear bomb because the the nuclear reaction or the I can't remember what the heck you call it, but the uh, the sustained reaction or whatever, the math says it can't be done. They they portray that really brilliantly in Oppenheimer. It's really cool. Um, or the thing about bees can't fly, so they they it it like evolution can't explain uh, that bees can fly because it's literally impossible. So throw away so, your theory. No, study it, investigate it, which is what you said, Cole. But I feel like right. Carl, so, you're saying yeah. Don't do that. And Two I'm just things. saying, like, this oh, is God, useless. I'll let saying. Carl speak for himself. I don't think that's at all what he's saying. And, and that's, that's why I wanted saying. to jump in. I don't, I think, I don't know if it's that you... But that your you hypotheticals in a vacuum or, prove nothing. Right, but I don't, here's well, Cole what, here's understands what, what I'm saying, yeah, so let's he, like Here's Cole. what I think you're missing. And by the way, I am not actually super familiar with the argument that Carl is ascribing. And, and because of that, I'm not willing to say that, like, yeah, I believe there is some merit to this. I jumped in in the middle of this conversation, but what I wanted to jump in with was that I don't think you're engaging with the idea on the basis that either because of a misunderstanding of it or something, you you think that it is claiming that there's some problem that there isn't. What I, What he's saying is not, well, here's this objection, it's a priori, it's deductive, therefore no experimentation needed, natural selection doesn't exist. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying, if I'm understanding this correctly, and I'll let him speak for himself in a moment, is that there is this way in which the current model for natural selection is failing our ability to make these a priori judgments about, you know, causal relationships between phenotypic uh, traits or genotypic traits and and the observed, uh, you know, pressure from natural selection, selectivity, whatever. Um, and because of that, we That's might right. want to give some thought about how we can retool the model of natural selection or come up with an entirely different model in order to uh, have that explanatory power. Because in so many other areas of science, that explanatory power is massively beneficial. Exactly. Uh, now, one of the things that admittedly makes this conversation different in the realm of, of evolutionary biology than any other field is that... Uh, evolutionary biology is a field in which experimentation is very rare and, and often not possible. Um, so this is one particular example of a field where actually fitment of a model to an observed set of data is the priority over simply the development of a model off of observed data and then testing and experimentation because of the time scale of evolution. That very last part I didn't I didn't quite catch because my computer did a glitch on me and I was fixing something. But because of the time scale of evolution, what, yeah, what was the issue? Yeah, basically what I'm saying is, uh, it, it, like, if take an example of another field like particle physics, right? Particle yeah. physics, there's a was a you know aside from the red tape of how long it takes to get a new kind of particle accelerator built. You know, if you've already got the machinery, there is relatively comparatively little time between the theoretical physicists saying, hey our models have predicted this, or we have this new model that predicts this and we want to test this thing, so we get to do experimentation. Because of the nature of the evolutionary biology being a less experimentable kind of science, that doesn't mean that experiments don't happen in evolutionary biology, of course they do, but largely evolutionary biology is you know, not separate from other sciences in terms of like that there's something fundamentally ontologically different about it, but just in practice, evolutionary biology is far more rooted in the kind of theorizing and philosophizing and model building side of the science as opposed to the practical applied experimental side of the science because of that time scale of the fact that evolution oh, happens right. over you know millions of years. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So yeah. to to address what you were talking about, I directly asked Carl about this. I was like, so what is the point of bringing this up? Um, and on the one hand, I heard, it sounded like you said that there, like, is no point, but then later you were like, well, no, it's to, like, be able to do, uh, new and better science, and so... Well, one, I brought it up... That was but, kind so of when... a lot of reasons joined. why to bring it up. I mean, one, I think that just talking about this stuff is interesting and fun, right? Just by itself. Uh, I don't think gods exist, but I like talking with Christians and theists about their belief, right? I don't think that really impacts me or changes me in any way, but it's fun. The same way that I like playing video games or whatever, right? It's just a fun thing to do. I think that's enough. Uh, but there's like, there's more. Um, I'm concerned about the kind of intersection of science and philosophy. I think there are um, 
really like uh, I think the kind of side bros that have this disdain towards philosophy have a rightful disdain <laughs> towards philosophy and the lack of consensus. And I think that Phil bros, um, right, have rightful disdain towards scientific inquiry and the lack to kind of work, right? I kind of want a road that meets together. I think Fodor's argument is a great example of uh, scientific inquiry that's unwilling to understand the philosophical objection. Uh, I've yet to talk with, like, the only person I've talked with that's given me decent consideration um, and took time to understand the argument before responding was Forrest Falkai, which I spent a weekend with um, in person. And we had great conversations about it, really good conversations. But I've, apart from that, I've yet to have, like, anybody that, like, takes the, like, even remotely seems like they you know i don't what is this intentional stuff what is this extensional context i want to understand it it's always this this is a philosophical language game well that's not an objection right maybe it is but unless you can tell me what intentional means what extensional means and then go hey this is the problem with that i look mike i understand what that means here's the problem with it it's hard for me or anyone else to take the objection seriously because it doesn't even seem like it's being engaged with, right? So, and I'm just all I'm pointing out is the purpose of this is that I think that this is a serious objection. There could be issues with it, right? But we can't know what the issues are unless people seriously engage with the objection. And out of no, curiosity, if you did, wanted to, by the way, if you wanted a Jordan Peterson monologue, I could just go, "Well, you know what you need to do is have the axiomatic substrates of an archetypal <laughs> narrative." That, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, it depends on what you mean by selection, by what, you know, because it yeah. happened in a meta sense, you know, well, you know and that's where the goddamn so truth lies. Because you know, but it's like, yeah, man, that's what? real. Goddamn Lobsters, modern neo marxists <laughs> So basically, like, what what I'm hearing, I think we can all agree like, Jordan Peterson fucking sucks, but we can move. Yeah, that dude sucks. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> like what, I, what I'm hearing, Carl. Uh, Granted, like I'll be honest, like once we these guys got really into like the philosophical stuff, my my brain turned off because like th there's a bunch of like terms that I just didn't know, and I'm like, okay, well I'm I'm lost. That's why I didn't interject in a long time. But what what I'm gathering now is that you're there's a philosophical problem with the notion of natural selection that it doesn't pertain to like what it's supposed to be doing in terms of like what science says it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, it's supposed um, to be able to disambiguate between phenotypic traits but right. in the cases where there are ride-alongs um right I, you it since it's a causal mechanism you can swap out the ride-along right. and you can say that that ride-along was selected for and tell the exact same story right, right. and that's that's not so explaining not, anything not the exact same story no you can the counterfactual is the exact same because what no, comes I, along with the yeah because what comes along with the ride-along is the reproductive success you get the reproductive if, success if you get that ride along, right? yes, and where you get no, not necessarily, and you agree like so, the pumping of the again, heart. This is a yeah, again, but this, this is, is another that, this is hypothetical that doesn't work in the real world. History of the world, we we look at populations and we observe that like functional hearts, right? We look at functional anatomy and we make assessments. We understand that so, functional anatomy, like hearts lead to okay. reproductive success Here's... there is no need of natural selection to understand that having a heart versus not having a heart leads to reproductive success you don't need the theory to invoke that when, when you say ride alongs out of here and i just i'm asking this because again i'm unfamiliar with this argument i've got some tabs pulled up and i'll read into this more later but uh when you say ride along traits are you defining ride along as a a trait that rides along like a phenotypical trait that rides along with another phenotypical trait because of a genotypical change uh, or, or mutation in one particular instance or example of a mutation? Or are you referring to uh, ride-alongs as things that always occur together? Yeah, like where you get T1, you get T2, and where you get T2, you get T1. Okay, so for in like a, in a Lewisian kind of way, that there is no possible world where you get T1 but not T2. Exactly. Okay. Fair yeah, those are the only things of yeah. interest. Otherwise, so those like, are, but those you know, again, there's not a problem. So I think one of the problems is what I've been trying to do is not, I, I have not been trying to tackle the argument from like the point of these definitions of intentionality versus extensionality or, or whatever it is. What I'm doing is you're saying, cause I, I'm not good at that. And 
but maybe I should have said that early on, and I think a lot of people can can get it. But what I have been trying to do is you've been telling me that natural selection can't do these things or can't explain these things, and I uh, pretty much this whole time is it, have been trying to tell you like what natural selection actually can describe and what it can do. So for example, with this free rider thing, again, your examples are just hypotheticals and I don't think that they actually um, comport with anything in reality because what does a free rider look like in reality? This is why I talked about linked traits. Wait, so you when don't you think said, that science uses you gotta, counterfactuals? No, dude, you gotta let me do this, okay. Um, when you said that, you can't get... Um, or the, the free rider basically is always there. No, that's not how linked traits work. And again, the, the trait that may seem irrelevant, like if I have blank, if, if, you, if you are whatever, uh, if, if you have uh, high um, immunity toward some disease, you'll also have green eyes or whatever. There's, there's a high correlation between those two things that may be because the locus of where those genes are located is really close on the chromosome but so <clears throat> selecting for that green eye can explain why the person um has is, has a very high probability of being immune to that disease but it's not every single time so like when you couched it that way that that isn't true i'm 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 not understanding because like the point the point is is that like one hypotheticals like i can give you i've tried to give you real examples but even if not we use counterfactuals right and some people might say like well why you know why should we talk about things that are counter to fact like that seems unnecessary well that's what we do if x is the case we should expect y right uh, like say if i stepped off the curb um then i would have got hit by the car we could go observe like you know, at 2 p.m. when I was supposed to step off the curb, like, what was the traffic like? What, you know, was there buses? Was there a bus route? Was there high traffic? Was there speeding cars, right? Things like that. And we could assess the counterfactual. These things do matter because when we go for an explanatory thesis, we want to be able to explain what is expected. We want to be able to explain, you know, if X, you know, we should expect Y. It's not the case we should expect, you know, not Y, right? We want these types of expectations. But when it turns it, it out is. that the view is something like a buy low, sell high, th this is essentially what I'm charging natural selection to be. It's a trivial explanation. It's like, it's like me telling you in the stock market when you want to play it, I just say, oh, buy low, sell high. That will explain every dollar that you make and every dollar that you lose. But it doesn't explain what stocks you should buy. It doesn't give you any novel predictions on you know, what the corporate ladder might be like, right? There's no predictive success there. And what I'm charging is that natural selection is no more, no less than some buy low, sell high principle that sure, it explains, you know, in some trivial sense why phenotypic traits lead to fixation, but it doesn't explain like, you know, why some phenotypic trait rather than another will. It doesn't explain um, that some decofounding phenotypic trait leads to succession rather than another, because I can just use the counterfactual support to talk about thumping of a heart rather than pumping of a heart, and I get the same reproductive success, right? That's a selection of two traits. To actually rule that out, you'd have to come... for a phenotypic yeah, trait. Yeah, but to actually rule that out, you'd have to produce hearts that do thump and hearts that don't thump to to gauge whether or not thumping has anything to do with um ha has any actual yeah, survival no, no, no. that's the part that i'm conceding i'm saying me and you can look in the world and re and we could decofound the variables and just go yeah i mean obviously if there was just the thumping sounds like those things aren't gonna survive it's the pumping of the blood that's precisely what i'm saying that we don't invoke the theory. We can look into the world and just know through functional ana anatomy and uh, like through um, like any other statistical means of like looking at populations that things with those org with, you know, this organ or, you know, lacking that will have a higher chance of reproduction. That doesn't take anything more than some statistical analysis about populations. It doesn't take some theory to invoke what phenotypic trait is actually selected for. That's what natural selection is purporting to do. 
But like, given that, um, you know, we like have hearts that come along with this phenotypic trait of thumping, and I can tell you the same story in all of these cases, why is it not the case that I can just say what was selected for was the thump thump sounds? Because I get the same fixation of the phenotypic trait that leads to, to uh, fixation, right? Me and you can obviously tell it's the pumping and not the thumping, but natural selection tells us nothing about that. It can't deconfound those things. We know that so by just natural history and functional anatomy. Optimal foraging is, is it, is rates it, and things I'm like gonna, that. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot in the opposite direction now because this is just again, and this is with the the understanding. If traits aren't selected for Robert, then you can this. see the argument. Um, could it not then be said that uh, natural selection is in, in reality it's a more complex framework than than simply the notion that this correlation uh, and therefore this ride along is sufficient, but that our full model of natural selection is one where, yes, you have this precedent of a change in genotype begetting a change in phenotype, uh, which is, you know, leading to some sort of fixation of trait, um, but that we then apply additional, you know, factual information, knowledge of, of anatomy, of the historicity of a species, of whatever, um, in order to confirm and, like, debate the validity of some particular agent. In other words, like, very rare in science do we consider, you know, like a particular model to not, you know, be interoperable with other models. Um, so if natural selection is a model for describing behavior in the real world, we would expect that it also both plays well and transfers information to and from other models, which when combined with it provides additional explanatory power for one particular trait. And it's, you know, like you said, it's truth value in terms of, I guess, the if you want to be crude, like the truth maker, truth bearer argument yeah but like i think we do get so i may you tell me if i'm because i just want to make sure i'm not just ignoring what you're saying i think that we're getting this productive predictive success um what, what we're doing is invoking things like optimal foraging rates and predator prey uh, predator uh, prey sorry predator prey ratios right these types of statistical analysis do you think that those like right. those things don't invoke any theory of natural selection in order for us to assess the data like do you think that they do oh i i see what you're saying so no i see what you're saying you're making the claim that in other words natural selection is superfluous to these deeper things which we are actually using yeah i'm saying biologists are smarter than the theory they think they're invoking hmm. well, like, That's like look my gram like, we can go out to a population i can tell you that the population with longer necks are more likely to survive <laughs> Like I, my grandmother can tell you that I don't understand like why I have to invoke a th some trait. Like wh how is natural selection predicting that phenotypic trait, right? Like I'm not understanding how that isn't just an aspect of natural history and functional anatomy and understanding there, right? Just observing the world that invokes no so, like l you know latent theory. Part part of um, this is that I, I sorry go ahead. Oh, I I was just gonna say um peterson uh simon's in the chat I, oh yeah I he hasn't know. requested yet i saw i, I saw your little that. back and forth yeah i i was just trying i i'm trying to be quiet because um i i don't want to take over the live and i feel like i'm a little out of my league at this point <laughs> yeah oh yeah also let me know if i'm if i am yapping and need to make space for somebody else to join the conversation i'm happy to to bail out and i appreciate you bringing me up um one other particular charge that I would say is that maybe I'm trying to think of what the right way to phrase this is. So one of the things that, based on my understanding uh, is that, you know, this theory of natural selection that we have um, and OK, hold on. I want to be clear here. We are disambiguating between natural selection as a, like a driving engine behind evolution, not simply the propagation of traits spreading throughout a species. But I mean, natural selection. Yeah, if is it's just some description, correct. that's not really like informative. It's supposed to be, from my understanding, some explanatory thesis or some mechanism, right? But like, if it's some mechanism and it's a causal mechanism, the issue is that it's an extensional. Like, so you said you like philosophy, so you're familiar with like extensional and intentional contexts. So like, uh, yeah. Lo yeah. So like Lois Lane, or I'm sorry, Clark Kent is Superman, right? That's a true proposition. Right. And we take the proposition, uh, Superman can fly. Now we can swap out the co or the co-referential term 
Superman and Clark Kent with each other, and we preserve the truth value, right? Right. Some extensional yeah. context. Now think about that in a causal mechanistic sense. Think about like some right. dodgy I, I wire it. in if, the if, attic. If you were to swap, like, right, right. Then you can swap. Like you, you gave the analogy of of uh, smoke, the fire, and the fire. smoke. But, yeah. Right, but in in the case of, of evolution, if you're looking at a ride along trait, then you're not preserving that. The thing we're talking about an intentional. And, and, yeah, we're talking about an intentional context. If I swap the two. Uh, ride along traits, two coextensional traits. I risk preserving the truth value in the same way that when we say Lois Lane believes that Superman can fly, and I swap out Superman with Clark Kent, we risk preserving the truth value, right? So, for example, it's not going to preserve the truth value if I say what was selected for was camouflaging into its environment, and I swap out the polar right. bear of camouflaging into its environment with the the polar bear was uh, had selection for its whiteness. That won't preserve truth value. The, the problem. The problem that I have here is, and, and I'm not, I'm not laying that this is the case, but it's, I, it's something that I'm not for, immediately able to distinguish. But I worry that arguments like these can be very prone to a problem where what we're doing is essentially like a lexical shuffle as opposed to an actual like transmutation of a proposition. So in the cases that, that you're giving, and I, I totally but accept these, that, but, like, but the, the, the point is, is that they have reference, and the reference changed right. the value of the proposition being true. And that's not an objection to any other referent that changes any other language statement that we have. That's why I don't find this like language argument to be like, because then you're going to have to, by parity of reasoning, also suggest that when statements or words refer to things in the world that makes those statements true, that like that there's also the same language game going on. But then how is scientific inquiry Again, possible? I, I how is inductive skepticism that, I wasn't not alleging inevitable? That, that is happening. I was saying that I wasn't I was not confident that it wasn't. I, in other words, I had not assessed it for that yet. Well, my, sure, I, I'm my just, big problem yeah, I'm is not that you are. I'm just saying like that move gets frustrating because then equally like okay don't stop there like don't do this taxi cab thing where you get in the taxi cab and then just get out when you want take it all the way to the, your destination because i promise it's not favorable for you on your own positions right i will invoke a two quick and pull you down with me because i know that that like the point being you should have never made that you know language move in the first place because then if you want to make that move then great then we'll take true propositions that you use words for that have reference to those words, and I'll throw the same. No, hold on, sorry, that, that's face. not the case. That's not the case I was alleging. I wasn't saying that that happens in every case. I'm saying sometimes when we make arguments like this, by no directional or intentional fault, we're using language that is implying a sort of semantic relationship that doesn't exist in the actual propositions themselves because of the nuances of language. Again, I'm not alleging that that's something you did intentionally. I'm also not even saying that's something I think happened here. I was as a preface to a separate thought saying that I don't yeah, know Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm not trying to that. charge you with that. I'm sorry. So, yeah. Cole, I agree with you. Um, and, like, this is, the, this is one of the other main problems I'm having. Like because it's not the traits it's the genes like you were talking about camouflage or whatever right so the statement animals pass down camouflage to their offspring is false that's not how it works so when you couch your argument i, I feel like a huge amount of the argument no one's denying that the genotypic like you know priority <laughs> no one's denying that it's not like i divorce it from the gen like genotypic priority that'd be insane but you only talk that, about it in those terms. That doesn't resolve the problem. I, so let me ask you, uh, Peterson, when you invoke the genes or the genotype or whatever, how do you think that that absolves the extensional intentional context? I'll read you my or... bullet points when I looked into this. This was many months ago. Um, and like I said, I'd have to sit down and uh, think about this for a long time. Um, you, you snuck up on me. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just saying uh, this is a complex topic, right? But these are the it notes. Is, yeah, it's, th it's these obvious. are the notes I took. Okay, and they're in bullets, so hopefully I'll remember how to connect these all together. So just no, listen you, to this, way, and you can tell really me what you think sport. about it. No, you've been a really good sport. I'm not trying to. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, no, no you're. Yeah, you're great. Okay, so this is what I, this is what I wrote down. Um, um, natural selection doesn't select traits; it selects genes. So, for example, hemoglobin. Heme is selected, but not red. There is no law that selects heme. That this is something that Fodor actually brought up. Um, so when Jerry says things like, there is no law that selects heme and there are no laws for selection of any trait, 
he fundamentally misunderstands what's actually happening during evolution. Of course, there's no law that selects heme. Evolution is really chemical evolution. A bird does not pass down a beak. If that were the case, then Lamarckian evolution would be true. Organisms pass down genes that control for traits. And I, I brought up Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene earlier. That was the big revolution. Um, so um, what did I write down next? So Here's it, an- it, it's, it's worth noting to, in, re- in response to that, because um, I think that this is an example of you and Carl speaking past each other. You are both in agreement that what is actually being passed down is genes and that phenotype is encoded in genotype. The argument that's being made, though, is that natural selection, because that is where essentially the metal meets the road, the actual mm-hmm. traits meet the, re- meet the real world. It's the material manifestation of the trait, the phenotype, where mm-hmm. the actual pressure is applied. Then and only then is, is the, 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 essentially the trait preserved through the expression of that trait down mm-hmm. in the, the genotype. He's not saying that genes aren't, aren't how mm-hmm. they're passed along. That's not even what Fodor thinks. The argument that he's making is that that because that's where the the actual pressure is the the environmental pressure where it will manifest in more reproduction i mean and you can google you can literally just google does natural selection act on phenotype or genotype and every resource that i've just pulled it'll up say phenotype is in agreement in it'll say phenotype in every in every case um but which is fine like i want to go like if somebody has a different view then you know they're free to make a different case and then by the way the argument wouldn't apply to them because you know, maybe they just, you know, make some other case, you know, and, but by the way, this, which, which, which would just not apply easy, to this argument. There's a trivially right. easy way to verify this. And that's simply that because genetic code often contains information, which is essentially a kind of like a hamming encoding or like a, you know, parody information to protect against mutation errors, you can verify just through thinking uh, that this is the case because, you know, if a mutation within an organism uh, causes a genotypical change, but it doesn't cause a phenotypical change, then even if it's passed on to its offspring, like the, the thing which we care about, the actual trait yep. which is going to apply the selective pressure won't have been invoked, and that's not really considered natural selection. Exactly, exactly. Um, so one thing, too, is that Fodor and people that like myself that run the argument, we agree there is a fact of the matter, that there is a phenotypic trait that leads to fixation of population. Right. But like the one of the issues is that in like artificial selection, it's really easy for us to tell what is selected for because there's a mind, there's a belief state, there's like some intention. Like, you know, let's say Cole wants to breed dogs and wants short haired dogs or he wants brown dogs. Right. And he's breeding dogs and they're long haired dogs and there's uh, um uh, short-haired dogs and they're brown and I'm like hey you know man you got a bunch of long-haired dogs like you know is that a problem and he's like no I don't care about that I'm like, why don't you care and he just tells me his intention he's like well I'm selecting four brown dogs I don't care about this ride-along trait that they happen to come short-haired or they happen to come long-haired all I care about selecting for with my business are brown dogs I'm in the brown dog business and we get a, an ex like you know, inscribing that intention there is great. But what we don't want to do in science is allow for this possibility for creationists. So right? could, could, for people on. to give non scientific explanations that what drives evolution is can this I, mind, right? I we want to that. avoid that, right? But the problem is, is that we are not getting that when we use the causal explanation. We're, we're having this issue with the extensional context. And that's going to be a problem. So when you gave the Fodor quote, and he's talking about the chemical analysis. What I worry is that what he's doing there, because I'm not familiar with that quote, I have to read it, is that he's giving what he thinks is the story, that the solution is not invoking a mind, but like natural laws, right? But then you lose out on a biological story. That's his point. That We can describe these things at the level of chemistry or even further at the level of physics, but the point is is that you lose out, right, <coughs> on, your, on your biological explanation, on your biological theory, and you're just giving a physical theory. Right, which is what I, which is what I'm conceding the, the the thing is, is that you know maybe there's some, you know, law of nature or something. Well, but it when can't I, be, it can't be well, something in a biological story. When I had this con- <laughs> real quick, when I had this conversation with Danny, we kind of ended up at this point where we're like, well, if it's just, it, 
it was sort of like, well, then natural selection isn't a real thing because if it's all just happening at the at the level of the the gene or whatever or chemicals, then whatever, whatever. And then we kind of got to this point where I was like, well, I mean, yeah, but if that's the case, then the, like there is no biology, there is no biological law. It's just chemistry, and the chemistry is just yeah. physics. And he proposed that to be a problem. I was like, I, I don't really think, like, maybe you could say it's a problem, but I don't think it's a problem worth deliberating about. Because then then we have to throw our hands up and say, well, well there's no such thing as weather, like, cold fronts and warm fronts. Those don't create tornadoes because there's no such thing as a cold front. They're just molecules with different amounts of uh, energy, less less energy, kinetic energy than what we call a warm front. And it's like, okay, you know what? I literally agree that the standard model are the only things that actually exist, but nobody actually navigates the world that way. So then I was yeah, like, well, well then think, what's, what's yeah, the point just, of bringing we that? We lose out on the bridge laws, right? Like we have bridge, like you can't use certain language of physics to talk about certain language of chemistry and certain language of biology. It just doesn't translate well. We have things like well, bridge so, laws, right? Yes. But then you miss out on that. So now you're just saying, we don't have any biological story, and thus we don't have any bridge laws from the physical story to the biological story. That's fine. That's what I think's going on. But the problem there is that we give up on the biological thesis and its concession to the argument. Now, if we want to use this, like, like I'm a mere logical nihilist, so I don't think that there are objects with proper parts, right? I think we're just talking about Dude, that's awesome because i'm a myriological universalist <laughs> oh you are yeah so i'm like, a level yeah, 54 okay, that's, barbarian that's well so like i just <laughs> i just think that like particles like you know rearrange right i don't think that like like there's the ontology of a table that has a proper part or something like that i think that's just like what we do you know with language in our head really just, like, but, but i mean then, particles. I, would make, I would make the exact same argument as a myriological universalist i'd say every possible collection of simples Count, counts as an object. The only difference is that we attach semantic and linguistic importance to certain concepts because they're useful to talk about. Oh, so damn, me and you would have a really good conversation on that. But I mean, this, like, remind, this reminds me of the I, theme song to Danny Phantom. His molecules got all rearranged. <laughs> Gotta catch them all because I'm using Danny. Okay, I don't. I want to make sure we don't go down that road, though. Um, no, 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 Simon, I don't, I don't actually don't want to go down that road. The reason only I bring it up is that, like, I don't have a problem with kind of like what you're saying in that sense that if we embrace like the view that I'm saying, like that kind of falls out for free. Cause like when we talk about it, there isn't like, you know, by really there isn't biological functions. This is just a neat way for us to talk about like this collective of, you know, particles that we see from our perspective. If we we're some bird, you know, floating over some like football stadium, then like obviously the band members that are making shapes, we wouldn't say that like, oh, the letter S is like a real object. Like, no, like it doesn't matter if like the trillionth band member comes in there. Like it, it's just like particles that are forming in some shape, right? And that's, that's my view. And I think that's com completely compatible with what's going on in the world. But when we want to tell some story, like, you know, there's this ontology of the phenotype that's being selected for and stuff. Like I, there's a problem there because you're making these kind of commitments on the biological level that I just think causes a lot of problems. But, but anyway, I got to kind of I got to bail out here. Um, yeah, I appreciate so you guys let, letting me in. This has been a super interesting conversation. I got to go. Uh, I, I appreciate it, Carl. Uh, I'm going to follow you. You should jump in my Discord server. I'd love to talk Muriology sometimes. Uh, thanks, Peterson, for having me up. I've appreciated it. You're welcome. Yeah, I gave you a follow. Um, yeah, I'm going to bounce too. I mean, I. Um... Well, Carl, I've I've been I've been dying to ask you a question for clarification for like the longest time. Oh, sure. If you have a minute. Like, maybe I'm just a dumbass. I don't know. But if if we can do the deconfounding experiment in a Petri dish, if I can take what I believe to be naturally selected, why a trait exploded to a disproportionate outsized representation of the population and move it into a controlled environment, and watch the exact same thing take place. What is the issue? The issue is when it, when you're talking about deconfounding um, uh, ride-along traits, right? It's easy to deconfound like okay, sure. variables. But like I, I don't. But, but I can deconfound the here's ice and the whiskey Carl. to tell one what's thing, getting me one drunk. Moment. One <laughs> one one biological nuance is that in a population with genetic variants, there is no guarantee that they all will have the same ride-alongs. In, in a petri dish of bacteria, 
they can absolutely have enough variation between them, yet the, the causal transplant in one population does the same thing no matter what variation you put it with. Yeah, but I'm, look, I'm talking about like a specific case where like, so you would agree that there are cases where you have um, some phenotypic trait that's selected for and that there are ride along traits that come along with that trait. Right? Sure, like a whole genome. You can insert one, one, you can literally, we can insert one gene into a bacterial genome and do that experiment it, irrelevant of what the rest of the bacterial genome is. And yeah, but I'm, what, I'm, what I care can, about is what phenotype is being selected for. I have for. controlled for all of your ride-alongs. Yeah, but look, what I care about is what phenotypic trait is selected for. And if, if uh, the, the issue is, is an a priori, like there's not, the issue isn't going to be you going in the lab and solving this issue, which I wish was the case, right? Because like I care more about science we than have. I do philosophy. I, I but... feel like we have. Is that an oversight from philosophers that we, that they think we haven't? I don't. Well, what, what, what is it that you think you've done? So, I mean, it's super easy. Undergrads learn it in their biology class how to clone genes into other organisms, right? That's, that's yeah, but I'm not, I'm not talking about organisms. that. I'm talking about phenotypic traits that right. are selected we can, for. We can, yes, and we agree that phenotypes are underwritten by genes. Yeah, but right? how, So but, when I say I transplant a gene for a more efficient um, receptor binding into a particular bacteria for its, its host or whatever, like... We, we can clearly rationalize that a more efficient binding uh, might increase its infectivity rate, and that is why we see it survive. That's just the rationale. So we can run that experiment. We can clone that. But this more isn't this isn't an a posteriori objection. A population and watch it take over the whole petri dish. Yeah, but look, if <laughs> okay, so this is the issue. The issue is not like. Um, because it, it's not clear to me that you're understanding what Fodor's objection is by that response. So, and like, I don't know if I should with that. So, like, maybe I'm not, but like, we we, we can control for. Well, can I? Well, I, let me let me at least like explain why I think we, this we absolutely can. Control Carl, for I feel like I feel like Simon's a, doing what I was doing, and then you're giving the same response. You're saying it's dead on arrival because. I'm not saying it. Look, just tell me what Fodor's objection is so that it's clear to me that you understand what it is, right? I think that's a fair response for me to ask you because sure, otherwise I... you're objecting to something you don't know what you're talking Like in terms of, it's not like, obviously, Simon, I've been on lives with you talking with creationists and telling them that they just are wrong about their beliefs, right? I, and, I'm Jay Mike. I'm not, so... I'm, not, I'm not coming at this like I think you're... Y y you you think evolution or whatnot is is bullshit? I, I, no, evolution I, is a hundred percent true. You. I I'm not putting. I'm trying not to put words in your mouth. I know where you're coming from. My my whole thing is this this idea that we can't sufficiently deconfound natural selection and watch it recapitulate in front of our eyes. Like yeah, but do you I but do you understand, understand why we can't like in principle why like it's an in principle argument. Do you understand why I'm saying in principle we can't? If I can show you that we literally can, I, I then the principle doesn't stand. Um yeah, but do you know what the in principle objection that I'm making is? Cuz like otherwise whatever you I don't know like what it is like you could just be showing me a banana, but like how why would that be relevant? Like it's, it's it's important for me to know that what it is that you're showing me as a response to what you think I'm saying. Right. So so you, my understanding, right? I came in with this. Maybe I don't understand the argument. My understanding is that we cannot sufficiently say that natural selection is moving traits to fixation, because at any time, any instance, example that we see that we might explain invoke natural selection, we also see a bunch of confounding variables in the genome as well. That trait moving to fixation is pulling with it a whole genome worth of other things. Yeah, the selective so sweep, I get that. Like you're talking about something like selective sweep, but like that doesn't absolve any issue. Like, like 
like I can concede something like selective sweep, pulling along these uh, these genes. Like, I don't have any problem with that, right? I'm 100% on board with that. I'm on board with like considerations of uh, pleiotrophy, right? All that stuff is, like, I think, 100%, you know, grade A, awesome, great stuff. But the problem is, is when we point out, two, we have an organism uh, where it's purported to have some selected trait for some phenotype where there's a ride along. And the issue in principle is that causal mechanisms, right? Something like A causes B, right? Is an extensional context where when we have something that like, you know, the dodgy wire causing the fire and I replace fire with smoke because those two things are coextensive with each other, that I preserve truth value. Causal mechanisms will preserve the truth value. If it causes A, and what co comes along with A is B, then it also causes B, right? You can think of it as like transitivity, right? It causes A, what comes along with A is B, so it causes B as well, right? Now, the issue, though, is that when we talk about something like selection for, that is not extensional. That is intentional with an S, not with a T. Inten like, not intentional, you know, T-I-O-N-S, or T... I O N, but S I O N, intentional, right? The issue there is that when we have traits like uh, what is selected for is the camouflaging into its environment or its whiteness, or what's selected for is snapping at frogs, snapping at flies versus ambient black dots, that you couldn't tr transfer those two phenotypic traits and preserve the truth value. Natural selection is telling us a story that one of those phenotypic traits was selected for. But if it turns out that it was selected of those two traits, it's not doing what it purported to do in principle. And it can't in principle because the selection for is in an intentional context and the causal mechanism is an extensional context. So here's my question then. Those two phenotypes, we can just, we can just agree our genes. There's a gene for camouflage in that instance. The, what we're talking about, natural selection, this taking over of the population, this moving to fixation, this trait exploding in representation in the population. That's what we're calling natural selection, that we're not talking past each other? Um, I think we are. I'm, my understanding is that we're talking about uh, a se selection for process that leads a phenotypic trait to fixation in a population. But, but, that's, but that's, what we're, that's what we see in natural selection, right? If a trait is when when we invoke natural selection, we're saying that a trait, its gene, is propagating in the population. At first, a few individuals had it, and now more and more and more. We're, when we're talking about natural selection, selection, we're talking about selective pressures on the phenotype. That's and like un, that's like agree. uncontroversial, right? And you're just kicking the can down the road. We yeah, but agree well, that I've the told you, is underwritten this. by genes. I get that, but like, this, so I'll ask the same question. Invoking the genotype or genes, what do you think that does to solve the problem? What it does is we can that, know. We that can know. yeah, that we free can rider see trait. The trait in the gene no, you get the same population. phenotypic trait. What are you talking about? No, Carl, the thing you were talking you about with that the free rider those trait. genes all of a sudden erases the ride along phenotypic trait? It doesn't. Yes. Be yes, it, it, can, yes, it does. Yes, in the situation it, where that trait comes along, the genotype is the same. No, it's the same. No, confounding experiments. We move a phenotype into another more controlled organism, controlling for all the ride-alongs that you would invoke. We can transplant a phenotype by transplanting a gene and watch it move to fixation in a population in front of our eyes. Okay, so you, so you, so. But also, Carl, like, do you know about gene linkage? Look, okay, none of this matters to yes. whether or not... No, no, no. It absolutely okay, so, does. So, okay, so do you think... Okay, do you... Look, yes, I understand gene gene link, linkage. Okay. Do you, think that, do you think that if I did or I didn't, that somehow changes an extensional co uh, context of causal mechanisms versus the intentional context of selection for? Because I that's what I'm... Look, if I'm, getting, you, I'm starting, I'm starting to get slightly words. irritated because I what I want is an actual response to what I'm saying, not talking about empirical observations that aren't engaging with an a priori objection that an extensional causal mechanism is incompatible with the notion that selection for being an intentional context, right? That's the issue. You keep telling us, though, that the problem 
is that selection, natural selection can't distinguish between the, the favorable trait that we want and some trait that is a ride along that simply comes with it. And it can because, again, that's just a hypothetical, but we can look at real world examples of this and like, for example, linked traits. The like, you remember my immune to a disease and you don't have fingerprints analogy? Yeah, You're, but again, okay. all all no, of this just, is avoiding the a priori. No, objection, it's not. So, ahead. do you remember my do you remember <laughs> my example? Yeah, you link okay. some genes together yes. that that so, say in, that say that say nothing about the selection for process being incompatible. Yes, with they do. So, if so, you we can say that um, not having um, fingerprints informs you. Uh, to what like it is a good predictor of whether or not you're immune to this disease but that's not the but we don't have a confounding variable here it's not that well we can't tell if it's the fingerprint or something else that they, they come together very often because they are highly linked but they can be separated so you can separate out what looks like a free rider from the other actual trait. And Simon's telling you, yes, we can actually isolate those things and get rid of this uh, free rider problem. Merely just or we saying... Can, we, we can, can attack get, the free rider problem. Me, merely say. saying we can get rid of the free, free rider problem just in itself is begging the question against the argument that I'm running, right? The argument that I'm running is that there's an extensional context, which is a causal mechanism. Do we disagree that when there's a causal mechanism that A causes B... Or, and then be yeah uh, and you're saying we can't or, tell or, if just, it's like, the just, free rider want, or the want, other thing I and i we the, just gave you examples of how you can determine yeah, that. let's just but i'm gonna sh look i'm gonna run through the propositions and let's see what we accept and what we don't accept right because this will just make it so much easier for me we agree that when a causes b and b comes along with c in that case that a cause c do we agree with that sure great do we agree that when we talk about a context which um, is a selection for A, right, not of A, or I'm sorry, selection for B in this case, not selection of B and C, that it was selection, it was selected for B and not for C? Sure. Great. And do we agree that natural selection is a selection process that's a selection for or a selection against process? Sure. A lot of people we think agree that, that causal mechanisms are the one that I described initially, that they preserve the causal relation, that but C will be. What caused. I'm saying, but my. I'm, no, no, hold on. Do we agree with that? Actual biology. Uh, no, hold on. A, but do we agree with that? La this is just the last. This was the last thing I just wanted an acceptance on. Do we agree? It's just, it's honestly just getting just a re, re agreement. You agree now that causal mechanisms, right, when we talk about A causing B, that it causes C and that preserves the truth value, right? If I say that the dodgy wire caused this, the fire and I change it with smoke, we preserve truth value, assuming that the sure. fire caused the smoke. Sure. Great. Yeah. So then you can see the argument that in principle, a selection for process is not extensional and can't do what, or I'm sorry, if selection for process is intentional and can't do what it purports to do. Right. That just that falls out of accepting those things. You accept the incongruence of a causal mechanism and selection for also being a causal mechanism, but then you also accept in, congruent or in conjunction with that that it's an intentional context, that when we swap out these uh, co-extensional traits that we can't preserve the truth value. You can't have it both ways. We, we That's can, the problem. We can clear C from the board. Like we can know that A cause B. It just B. Like in biology, we don't need a C. We can control for C. The problem, look, we, if I drink a glass of whiskey, we can deconfound the variables. I can take the ice out, I can take the whiskey out. I can eat the ice and go, I didn't get drunk. So that's not what was, that doesn't explain my drunkenness. I can drink just the whiskey and that explains my drunkenness, right? But when we talk about natural selection on this intentional context, where it's supposed to select for, but it's some causal mechanism 
then we can't decofound the variables. But we literally can, though. I don't. Yeah, we. This is where we, this is we know where what I'm, genes. I'm struggling. We know how to do gene because linkage, we and we can isolate we can... things in the lab. And you just keep telling us that's not a solution. And we. D I don't get why it's not a solution. And uh, I don't want to do tell, this. Tell, I've, I've said it six times. What does intentional mean, and what does extensional mean? I don't want to. If run, we don't, if we, if we don't have an understanding of this, I can't Carl, take your objection Carl, seriously. I've, I, I really am. I'm not trying to be a dick here. I am just, I really feel like maybe, I don't think I'm misunderstanding your argument. Can you paraphrase what I am saying? If you're not, if you're, no, 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 this is not, you don't get to just, look, you don't just to declare I'm, when I'm, I'm not trying when to I'm, when I'm using here. specific I'm language and I'm asking page. you if you understand do it, you don't that, get to just, re like, to you know, reverse on you, man. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that you have clarity on what, I think is my objection. Can like, can you, can you give me that courtesy? Your objection is yes, we can decofound uh, the variables that are selected for. But and, that's and, and like, what, like obviously that's what, what I anticipate and, somebody who disagrees with the argument to say. That isn't telling. That isn't actually showing place. me. That isn't actually engaging with the a priori objection. This but isn't when we like the objection the isn't something that is take place deconfounding all the variables when we still see natural selection void of co-riding traits like what what does that tell us what does that look uh, 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 look telling me that you can deco that you're just telling me you could decofound certain traits is not addressing the problem the problem is in the cases where we have right along traits right where the where where you get that trait you also get the other trait in principle you can't there's no selection for by the way because there's a causal process at which we can swap out the, the traits that are selected of and we get the exact same counterfactual support i can say that the thumping of the heart that was selected for is going to uh, lead right. to a phenotypic yes. trait. Yes. I've that, heard this that, example. Oh, I don't times. know why I keep getting interrupted. Saying, genetically, we can often I don't, I don't know why separate I keep the thumping and the pumping. You've been doing it the whole time, J. Mike. J. Mike, I you keep for his entire explanation. You keep telling talking. us that. Well, you keep you keep giving us the reason why this is a problem because it can't um, it can't explain blank and then we give you examples of how it explains blank and then you go wait do you actually know what I intentionality you argument, versus you extensionality the means and then still want to deny it right that's the absurdity that we're at so far i gave you propositions you accepted all of them and somehow still want to reject it what i'm saying is yes i can agree with your argument but i don't think it holds true as some like if you agree with the thing. argument then i'm done here the traits, debate is over traits aren't linked all the time if we you can, agree with the argument see, the debate is over simon unlink them simon the debate is over if you agree with the argument in in the cases where traits are always in the hypothetical that traits are always and there is no way way to unlink them then sure yes have a field day but that's not reality though okay I, look i don't know all that just sounded like nonsense i don't understand what that oh welcome welcome to our world oh okay so like so it's not it's nonsense it's nonsense to you uh if it's nonsense to you then why have you not made an effort to tell me what you think extensional and intentional means after the fifth time of explaining it to you and what i am steel man my issue because I guarantee not one the, fucking, not one I of you feel, can fucking do it. I feel like it. I did. You keep telling okay, me. Steel man like it right I now. Did. I'll mute my mic and you go ahead and you steel man it. And don't just go, can't do confound the variables. Explain what I mean when I give the intentional and extensional context. That's the crux to the argument. Well, what I I've been like doing this whole just, time like, if you, is. If you ever read Fodor's book, you would understand that's the point of the argument. Which, by the way, for the, no reason. So go ahead and steel man the argument. I, I feel like I have given the argument to try. Uh, it's not to clear to me that you have, mind. so do it again. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I have like hearing issues. Go ahead and do it again. The, the whole proposition is that we can't uh, invoke natural selection as a selection for specific traits, because in every instance there are these ride-along traits, and we don't know. You're what already is wrong. 
Okay, okay then. There. Didn't say I, in I, every I like instance. The exact same I was actually very specific that, that it's not in every instance. It's very clear that there are phenotypic traits that lead to fixation of population of which don't have ride-alongs. That would be dumb, right? And also, I don't think that it's not the case that there isn't a fact of the matter about what phenotypic trait uh, leads to fixation because even Fodor himself in his book concedes that and every biologist for whatever reason that's responded to him thinks that he's not agreeing to that when he says it like seven times clearly. It just like goes to show that people that are engaged in the scientific liter literature aren't actually reading and engaging with the philosophical literature, which is so frustrating because if it's such an easy argument to dismantle, if it's such an easy argument, such an easy language game, then it would be like, you know, maybe one thing to understand the book and use the language that Fodor uses and use the like thesis that he actually pre presents, which he goes over intentional extensional context, like just throughout the entire book to actually engage with that. None of that is what I said. What I said was that there's an intention. Like, so again, that's why I asked you to use the language. Do you know what intentional context means and extensional context means? If you don't, then I'd like, I don't know how many times I have to say it. Like, I, I can't just tell you seven times and expect you to understand it. <laughs> I, mean, I can only say it and then ask you if you understand it, and we we run through it. Don't you feel like having to explain something several times might be an indication of an inability to communicate an idea? Okay, so 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 you so you, you do you seriously struggle with this? Let's see if you struggle with this. I, I came let's see if you, no no. Let's see if you struggle with this. In extensional context, let's, no, Simon. Let's see it. if you actually <laughs> struggle you with don't this. Get it. Let's actually see if you struggle with this. In extensional context. So you believe, like, right? Superman can fly, right? That's part of the story, right? You're yes. not. So okay. you're not defining right. these oh, terms. No, no, you're giving like this. examples. Please, please of let me them. get through this with them. If it's the case that Superman can fly, and Clark Kent is Superman, we agree on that. Then we can swap out Superman and Clark Kent, and we can preserve the truth value, right? Clark Kent can fly, right? You're not actually Correct. define. You you told us we can't define these, and you're not defining them. You're giving I'm, examples I'm, of yes. them. Yes. Extensional context is when you can swap out co-referential terms and preserve the truth value. And I'm giving you an example of that. Okay. Okay. Extensional, the ability to swap out co-referential terms, terms and, and preserve the, the truth value of the proposition, right? Because, Fantastic. Yeah, because think of it in the context where Superman can fly and Clark Kent is Superman. We can swap out that and we preserve truth value. But if we specify someone like Lois Lane believes Superman can fly and we swap out Superman with uh, Clark Kent, that proposition isn't true. There are certain contexts that matter when talking about preserving truth value of propositions. And in this case, the intentional context with an S, intentional, is that when we swap out Clark Kent and Superman when talking about Lois Lane's belief states, it's not true that we preserve the proposition because she doesn't know that Superman is Clark Kent. Now, what I'm saying is that natural selection is that intentional context. It's saying that it can select for one of those things. And if we swap out the ride-along trait, we won't preserve the truth value. The same way that if we swap out Clark Kent and Superman, we won't preserve the truth value. But causal mechanisms are extensional. They're like the context where we swap out Clark Kent and Superman, and it does preserve truth value. And so in other words, causal mechanisms can't disambiguate between the selective process on what was selected for. In principle, they okay. can't do that. So, Carl, when, what, what, hold on, hold on. Let me do this because I, I don't want us rate. to get I don't want us to get chippy because I want us to be like on the same side. So, what you said? I get going soon. I said that like forty five minutes. I, ago, I, I know. Like, so, and we can try to. But you said we can do a part two. Plan. I mean, you, know, you I love you. You said the problem is we can't distinguish between the free rider and the the trait in question, right? Isn't that kind of what I'm you just said? I'm saying biologists can. I'm saying natural selection, the theory of natural selection right. can't do anything in the theory to disambiguate between those two. Biologists okay, can't. Sure. When Simon does it, he can. He's not invoking natural selection in order to do that. Okay, That's so we must, be, am, we must be... I am, though. I'm, Simon, I'm saying that you are smarter than the theory you invoke. In, in my Petri dish, I am watching natural selection. I'm not doing some genetic. Exp I am literally watching. What's the prediction? What's the population. prediction? Natural selection gives you. What's I'm watching a population change because a trait was transplanted into it, and it's now moving to fixation. What's the prediction? I, what phenotypic trait leads to fixation under that prediction? Whatever I think that trait uh, is in that circumstance. I gave yeah, but the you're, like, of like, the if it just turns efficient... out to be something that leads to reproductive success, we just have some like, exactly, weird tall... exactly. Okay, then, then great. Then it's the same thing I said earlier that it's just some trivial buy low, sell high principle in economics. 
right? Just merely like you're not getting that out of uh, any theory. You're just like invoking some functional anatomy, some like natural history of what typically survives and what typically doesn't. You don't need natural selection to invoke that. If you thought that you did, there would be some novel prediction invoked in your theory. But nature selects tell me what which traits get through the environment. Or better yet, tell me tell me what prediction in natural selection gives that if it hadn't come true would render natural natural selection false. Tell me, sorry, say that again. N name me a prediction natural selection makes that if it hadn't come true would render natural selection false. Um, for natural selection. Yeah, it's unfalsif It's unfalsifiable. <laughs> um, I don't think it's necessarily. Unfalsified. It is. It's, so like, there's not a prediction that you will be able to give me that if th the theory is true, uh, wouldn't be true under the theory. So I can think it, of a lot of see, you I can think of a lot of things that would disprove evolution, but I've never been asked to come up with something that would disprove natural selection before. I mean, that's interesting. I feel like it would be almost impossible to disentangle just evolution and natural selection uh, in that case. Does that make sense? I don't know that I understand. Maybe you want to say it again. Um. Okay. Like I can think, of, I can think of examples, like observations or whatever, that would disprove evolution. Um. Oh, that's not my issue, though. I think evolution is. 100 yeah, I know. True. But if if it's evolution by natural selection, then to me, those are just the same, kind of like the same thing. So I've never been asked to produce something that would disprove natural selection that's an interesting one I, I don't think that they're like i mean i could be proven wrong on this but i don't think that there is like the, part of the issue that i think here is that because of this issue it doesn't even seem like there's like a falsification criterion it, all we're doing is merely observing like organisms that uh, have some phenotypic traits that we observe with like functional anatomy of optimal foraging rates uh or op yeah optimal foraging rates predator pressure uh I mean, if Sorry, we prey, if we observed, I feel like if we observed that um, allele frequencies just never change, uh, yeah, and, that would disprove evolution. But I, that's a fact that you would just yeah. Be, I don't know how anybody could ever look at a population and say there aren't allele like you know frequencies. Or yeah, but I'm trying to you figure have like out Hardy Weinberg equations to show you yeah. literally how much evolution is occurring in a population. Right, like I, don't know. I concede to the, like all of that, but. You know, maybe maybe this isn't as important of a point, but this you know an overarching point is that I don't find this to be a scientific theory. Like what we have with other processes in evolutionary biology, right? Like selective um, or sexual selection and um, uh, genetic drift. All these things we can make really good. I think we can make really good predictions that invoke the content there. But I don't know that we're doing that with natural selection. Right. Right. Um, I just I want to. We've been doing this for two hours, and, and I yeah, do I gotta move get on. going myself. I had I, I had, apologize if I've been hostile towards you. That's fine, whatever. I, um, I had two really quick questions. Um, when you talked to this with Forrest, did he say that? Did he argue that it's well? No, the selection happens on the gene level, or what? He and he was. Um, or did he say f phenotypes are selected? He he was under the impression that pleiotrophy could solve the issue, but I don't, I don't see how it could because oh. I think in like cases, yeah, but like we're talking about cases where pleiotrophy isn't even like relevant. Another thing would be a lot of biologists say that well, actually, natural selection doesn't select for anything; it selects against things. Yeah, that's Rosenberg's response, but selection against is still an intentional context. Selecting against some trait rather than the ride along or whatever trait is still like you can still phrase that as a selection for. But even if we don't worry about that, it still um, risks preserving the truth value once we swap out the co coextensional traits, which is what the ex the intentional context is worried about. That like you know we can't say that Lois Lane believes Clark Kent can fly because she doesn't know that Clark Kent is Superman, right? And the reason that that matters is that under natural selection swapping out the right along trait and saying that that one was selected against um, is going to be an issue because um, for the same reason that the causal mechanism 
I feel like every time oh, shoot, I try oh, to shoot. translate this into a biological experiment, I'm just <sighs> rejected and say I must use philosophical language. Yeah. So, Carl, I, I real quick. Philosophical language, it's love... a priori objection. It doesn't have anything to is, do with empirics. The same way that if I had some interpretation of quantum mechanics, some guy could just armchair look at my theory and point out a problem in, like, in principle with the language I use, with the phenomena that I invoke. I mean, he, he doesn't have to go out and do any empirical work at all to show that in principle, I can't do what I'm purporting to do. If we, if like your alternative yeah, is to that say to that so... every theory is not is not susceptible to some type of objection like that, and that's ridiculous. But what I'm saying, it, what might be also true, is that yes, this argument holds in specific cases, but not in all cases. Like. If, I like if, how all the people that are like, oh, this guy's going to drive no, me to drinking are the same people that follow my main. Like, you guys should, like, figure it out. If, I, if, I'm, <sighs> I don't know. if I'm saying there is no extensional problem, why, why then is this still even... Why does this even matter? We're going to have to do a part two. Because it's been two hours at this point. And we have an echo. But thank you, Carl. Thank you. No, that's fine. Yeah, appreciate it. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. So, like, the issue I kept having there, Simon, was the extensional intentional thing. I I fully admit that's very hard to keep track of um, and make sense of. But what I kept doing was he kept saying, well, those are pr those are problems because you can't address, like, the free rider problem, for example. And then you and I kept trying to say, well, no, this is how we can address that. And then he kept saying, yeah, but you don't know the definition of blank, and that doesn't that doesn't actually address what I was saying. And I I was not trying to be slippery or anything like that or try to like change the subject in a subtle way. I was not trying to do any cheap tricks. I was just saying, I'm hearing you tell us that natural selection can't explain this, and then we're trying to give you scientific examples where it can. And so it was just it was just frustrating. <laughs>